It's good to see you. I am Sister Jacinta Kresik from the Department of Philosophy and Theology here at the University of St. Francis. We thank you for coming this evening. It's certainly a warmer evening than our originally scheduled date for this lecture, which was during that frigid polar vortex that we survived. And surely it's all for the good that we're able to gather at the start of the Lenten season and delve into this profound question, what is truth? Particularly, that we consider the nature of reality from a Christian perspective. We have a very competent guide for this venture, a faculty member who is well-versed in theology and philosophy and a variety of areas, including Latin. He is a native of St. Louis, who completed his doctoral studies in historical theology at St. Louis University. It's my pleasure to introduce the newest member of our department, Assistant Professor and Program Coordinator of Theology, Dr. Alexander Giltner. Good evening. Can you guys hear me well in the back? All right, so I'm loud, so that should help. Um, I'm really uh, glad to be here. This is the first time I've been able to participate in this lecture series put on by the department, and uh, this is my second semester here. I have to say it's been already an incredible journey, and I'm really thankful to be a part of the faculty and university here. Um, tonight... I, uh, I figure you're coming to a college for a lecture, so I'm going to give an academic lecture, which means I hope you brought your waiters, because we're going to go deep. And if you don't feel like you're up to it, it is Lent, so just offer it up. Offer that suffering up to the Lord. Um... And I also really want to welcome my students, whom I'm about to poke fun at a little bit. Um, and if you're here expecting, you know, what happened, no, that's not how we do things at formal lectures. If asked uh, what often impresses me most about my students, I wouldn't say their intelligence or their wisdom or diligence, although they have, they have all those in abundance, most of them. It would be, actually, their acute sense of justice, of fairness. Not necessarily what justice means, but that justice exists and it is something we should care about. Uh, the moments they truly come alive is when they encounter some rule or some story or some reading that speaks to them of injustice or unfairness. This appears to me to be rooted in a rather wondrous, if somewhat vociferous, Desire to protect personal dignity. For better or for ill, and I'm going to argue in a bit that ultimately is for the good, but all in due time, the individual person in our current society is invaluable, and most especially their autonomy, which must be protected at all costs. No one should be forced to think, believe, or even act in any way, so long as their thoughts, beliefs, and actions do not encroach upon the thoughts, beliefs, and actions of other people. On the other hand, what has often most disappointed me about my students is their seeming lack of desire to fit this conviction into a coherent, consistent view of the world. They champion rightly, oftentimes, all kinds of causes, like the dignity of women in a society that often mistreats them, yet oftentimes not the dignity of the unborn, or even at this point, born babies. They defend the rights of a society to have different logics and moralities, Yet they don't understand that this means, by, uh, this means defending by extension societies that utterly reject this moral trajectory. They expound on the need for justice, yet scream chants against immigrants, ignoring their own history. They hold that the ultimate moral rule, and this is generalization, of course, is to let people be whatever they individually desire to be. And that every single person better follow this rule by God, or else. It's... Irrational, but it's an irrationality held, at least unconsciously, by many insightful, intelligent people. 
I could give you a couple examples. <clears throat> One of my favorite things to do when we're discussing this question of does objective truth exist, does objective morality exist, is to, um, I put a little picture up on the, on the PowerPoint of a couple engaged in um, consensual osculation, kissing. And um, I say, is there anything wrong with this? No. Ah, but what if I told you they were brother and sister? And of course, you know. Uh... <laughs> and I say, but is it wrong? Well, yeah, it's wrong. Why? Well, because genetics. No, 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 no. They're, they're both, like, fixed. They can't do the thing that creates the baby. Uh, well, they can do that thing, but they can't, you know. Well, but it's wrong because because uh, uh, they grew up together. They were siblings. No, actually, they met late in life. They were, like, separated at birth. Well, I guess it's okay. Really? Is this okay? Incest is okay? Well, if they're not hurting anyone, that's the key, right? If they're not hurting anyone, what do you mean? Like, is incest only bad if you're hurting each other? Like, if you kiss, then you both, like, black each other's eyes or something like that? Well, it's, it's wrong for me. That's where it always goes. Or we could raise the stakes. I tell them about, uh, this is actually attested to in tribes unrelated to each other. There's no cross-pollination throughout the world. Anthropology has found these uh, tribal peoples who will upon uh, the birth of twins, view the twins as some sort of supernatural threat to the society, um, as if a curse has been committed. And their remedy to this is to expose the twins outside of the village, to cast them out. That's how they deal with the crisis. That's how you fix the curse, so to speak. I asked them, is that wrong? And it's surprising how often they're not sure. And I get it. Well, they don't don't know it's wrong. Okay, I'm not asking are they culpable. I'm asking is it wrong. Well, they think they're doing something right. Yeah, I agree. They think they're protecting the tribe. They have a good intention. But is it wrong? Well, it's wrong to me. But I'm not them. I don't know them. I think this, in my albeit short years of teaching, uh, I have observed that this confirms the argument of Alistair McIntyre, first made in the early 80s, that we as a society are primarily emotivists who champion intuitions and preferences of the individual persons, not logic, reason, or objectivity. Logic is cold, reason is oppressive, objectivity is just plain impossible, and in any case, these things limit the God or not given God, God-given rights to be themselves, they're true persons. You do you, my students like to say. You guys say that? You do you? You do you. Just don't do you in any way that inhibits my right to do me. And now we just sound really weird. <laughs> there are no moral universals, only attitudes and desires. Nothing is intrinsically good or bad. Things only impinge upon or on persons or they do not. For emotivism, moral claims are really just expressions of approval, grounded in feelings of approval, not in rational demonstration of such. Statements like, this is right, or it is good, are really just expressions of, I approve of such and such a state of affairs, or this feels good to me. Now, this sort of reasoning is clearly aided by an ingrained relativism. Relativism, which is the notion that no objective truth actually exists, but all truths are relative to the persons or societies that hold them, enables people to have convictions while not really requiring those convictions to cohere, or at the very least not contradict. With relativism, reality is an unbridled horizon of personal expression, and this is certainly attractive. Indeed, I think too often we do not give the relativists a chance to make her case. As one who was once a relativist, as well as an atheist, I did have reasons for my position. 
I have known relativists who were not at all irrational or unintelligent people. At the bottom of the claim for relativism lies a claim that I do think, in fact, is in many ways true, that all conclusions are built upon a set of principles, often considered self-evident, and as such, while arguments can be made for those conclusions, the first principles themselves are just that, first principles, and so must be taken de facto. But not everyone submits to the same first principles. Furthermore, people do not just possess different principles. They have different traditions, backgrounds, different sets of experiences and perceptions of reality. And these factors, along with many others, all influence how a person views the world and the truth of it. Each one of us approaches any given state of affairs from a unique perspective, a perspective that frames and filters our understanding and judgment of that state of affairs. These varying factors allows us to reach conclusions about the world that are perfectly suited and correct for the individual, irrespective of conclusions held by others. Now here is the rub. This is, a very, as I already said, in, in, in some very true sense, the case. And since we are subjective creatures, in as much as we only possess our own experiences, we don't possess other people's experiences, and we certainly have, we have certainty about this or that truth, we rightly suspect that a person who is convinced otherwise has had a similar experience of their understanding of the world, or their truth. Scare quotes. They are just as convinced of their conclusions as we are. So what, what grounds do we call them wrong? I can't see things the way they see them. So how am I even to truly evaluate their view? Indeed, it seems almost wrong to do so. To do so would be to invalidate them, to say it is wrong to be them. Now, of course, this is defective reasoning, or rather a lack of reasoning. And that has been shown like ad nauseum at this point, right? To have the perspective that there are no univ- there is, can be no universal rule among perspectives because each perspective is an equally valid claim to truth leads to all kinds of absurdities, such as the fact that it itself is a universal uh, rule among perspectives and that it must also accept the perspective that their claim is in fact wrong and that perspective would have to be as equally valid as their own. The claim that there are no objective truths is in itself an objective truth claim That must transcend subjectivity. My favorite refutation of relativism comes from Bonaventure. Those of you who know me are not surprised. Who writes, The light of the soul is truth. This light knows no setting. And it so greatly radiates upon the soul that it cannot be thought or expressed not to be, lest a person contradict herself. Because if it is not the truth, this is true that it is not the truth. Therefore, something is true. And if something is true, it is true that it is truth. Therefore, if truth is not, it is also truth. As, Edris, as it is said in Ezra, truth then prevails over all. I know less than half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. <laughs> but I think we see the logic here. If you say there's no such thing as truth, is that claim true or false? Whoops, it doesn't work that way. It is self-refuting. Fine. We've heard this, but the problem is with emotivism or even bare-bones relativism, no simple appeal to rational scrutiny is going to work. I have had people hear the common spiel about the incoherent, self-defeating, self-refuting nature of relativism only to respond that, yes, that's my feelings on the matter too, which is absurd. But, That doesn't matter for emotivism. Yes, exposing two-year-olds to the elements is wrong for us, from our perspective. But from their perspective, it's right. Yes, the long law of non-contradiction is true for us, from our perspective, but it's not true for them. Relativism is a de facto rejection of any universal rational court of appeal. One can point out that people don't really act like relativists, and nobody does. You know, I don't think anybody who comes in on, say, their spouse cheating on them will accept the answer, oh, well, that's your truth, honey. My truth is that I'm being perfectly faithful. No. But relativism 
while even though in, sincerely impossible to act out, is not exactly rationally refutable because it's not actually a rational position. Reason, logic, etc., these are simply expressions of approval by persons. To say that is logical is to say, yeah, that makes sense to me in relativism. It is only approval by persons whose opinions ought to be respected, but not necessarily anything beyond that. I sometimes wonder if relativism isn't just sort of a warm skepticism. The late anthropologist Paul G. Herbert observed that the postmodern, or what he often himself terms the late modern position, usually attended by one sort of relativism or another. There's actually more than one. I wonder what they think of each other. <laughs> that sounds like a good relativism. It's not mine, but it's good. But it's an outworking of the distrust, of a distrust of the hyper-rationalization or the hyper-rationalizing and colonial tendencies of the modern project. He writes, increasingly, increasing rationalization, like in modernity, has not led to better, more meaningful lives and greater personal autonomy, but to greater differentiation between fields of knowledge, to increasing specialization and fragmentation of knowledge. I mean, think about that. How many disciplines are there now? How many majors? Holy crap. Lots of majors, lots of different majors, majors for everything. In part, the critique of reason is rooted in modernity itself, which subjected all other systems of belief to critical analysis and eroded their authority, like revelation, like reason, this is, or, or religion. This is Kant within the mere, the bound, religion within the bounds of mere reason. This is the, the, the pure critique of Schelling or Hegel. Well, not exactly Hegel. Hegel's a little different. Anyway, it's not important. Still continuing with, with Hebert. Now, the same critical reflection has been turned against reason and science and deconstructed their claims to truth and authority. Modernity was built on skepticism towards traditional knowledge. Postmodernity is built on skepticism towards modernity. The modern project promised us peace and prosperity, and it did, simply did not deliver. At least, not like it said it would. And even the great goods that have been achieved, particularly in technology and medicine, because not everything modernity has done is bad. Air conditioning. <laughs> Thanks, modernity. But these have been overshadowed by great darknesses, examples we are all fully aware of. World wars, systematic genocide, nuclear armament, staggering economic disparity, widespread oppression, and marginalization at a level of efficiency that is truly astonishing. Herbert goes on, Hebert, excuse me, goes on. In the modern worldview, reality is ordered according to laws that human intelligence can grasp on the basis of a positivist epistemology. Modernity promised order and fulfillment. But the fact is, today the world is full of chaos, dissatisfaction, and misery. Emotivism, like its philosophical cousins what we can loosely, I guess, call postmodernism or postmodernisms, bear what Jean-Francois Lyotard called an incredulity to grand narratives. The grand or meta-narrative of modernism championed reason and rationality and set itself up against all other narratives in a form of intellectual conquest, often in conjunction with an actual physical conquest. But in the end, despite its many incredible feats, this so-called modern project was the primary cause of its own demise, for it could not bear the scrutiny of its own rational inquiry. What makes rationality authoritative? In the Enlightenment's ultimate abandonment of metaphysics, there remained no ground, namely being of the sort like the scholastics championed, to uphold even rationality itself. Ironically enough, this weakness of the Enlightenment thought is almost as old as the Enlightenment itself. The seeds of its demise were already planted by David Hume, the Scottish empiricist and skeptic who argued, and this is quoting him, in moral deliberations we must be acquainted beforehand with all the objects and all their relations to each other, and from a comparison of the whole fix our choice or approbation. While we are ignorant whether a man was an aggressor or not, how can we determine whether a person, the person who killed him be criminal or innocent? But every, after every circumstance, every relation is known, the understanding has no further room to operate, nor any object on which it could employ itself. Here's the key. The approbation or blame which then ensues cannot be the work of the judgment, but of the heart. 
and is not speculative proposition or affirmation, but active feeling or sentiment. No one knows everything. Therefore, even the most obvious truths, truths, save the law of non-contradiction, that something can't both be itself and not itself at the same time, are appealing and approbated on the basis of our feelings. I hear Darth Vader, search your feelings. You know it to be true. Modernism has bequeathed so many great and horrible things, including the knowledge that rationality can be used to cause suffering and for evil purposes. It can even be used against its own self. Relativism and motivism, these put rationality in a limited playing field, maybe like disciplines like science or logic, where it can't hurt nobody no more. True or false, good and bad, these are not objective realities, they are perspectives. And everyone is entitled to their own perspective. Live and let live, or some such. The problem is this fixes the problem a little too neatly. To fight for everything is to fight for nothing. Rationality comes from the Latin word ratio, which is, could be translated something like structure, or even like the word logic. The rational faculty enables us to see the structure of reality, the whole and its parts, their relations and the ways they signify and uphold each other. That is, it is, among others, an interpretive function, a way to grasp and explain the intelligibility of the world, to extrapolate meaning, and to do so in a fashion that is externally verifiable to one's own subjective consciousness. If the individual's subjective consciousness is the sole provider of meaning, then only internal experience is meaningful, and therefore, thus, there is no external objective meaning, which is to say, the world is meaningless. Every if every opinion or even conviction is valuable, then none is prescriptive, and therefore none is, ironically, of any real value at all. We're just a bunch of opinions walking around, smashing up into each other. Thus, there is only meaning in how we see the world and how we each actualize ourselves within the res our respective fields of existence. My meaning is what I live for. My meaning interacts with others and their meanings, but does not and cannot meld with anyone else's because I am only my perspective and they only are, are only theirs. My meaning is born with me and it dies with me. Heaven hopefully awaits. Sometimes this feels empowering, but it's actually not at all. Sometimes it induces despair, and it should. But most of the time, I see it endured with a sort of quiet resignation, or just simply ignored. This is the price of an unrestricted, unbridled personalism, slavery to persons and their perspectives. In fact, look on social media. People don't win arguments by rational argumentation anymore. They win it by throwing their socioeconomic status like trump cards. Well, my experience says this, and you can't say that's wrong. They even talk about rationality being some sort of tool of oppression. It is perhaps unsettling, but I guess it's more convenient. One may desire universal meaning, but one may not claim it because that is just plain rude. This picture is in many ways too simple, I grant, but I do not think it's inaccurate. I think I th in fact, I'd say it's quite accurate. And if I were to paint a fuller picture... That would be definitely rude to those of you who wish to leave this lecture at a decent hour. Okay, fine. Truth is so fundamental a reality that even to reject it is to prove it, proclaim it, submit to it. There is no such thing as truth, really. Okay, should I accept that as true? But such an account is hardly unique to Christianity. As I've said... The problem is not that philosophical arguments for certainty of truth are lacking. As anyone could clearly see, they're not. And many people have showed this. The law of non-contradiction is not Western logic. The East has it too. There's many texts of Hindus and Buddhists who talk about the law of non-contradiction. As Ravi Zacharias once said in India, it's either the bus or me when I'm crossing the street, but definitely not both. Rather, it seems we live in a society, society that just doesn't place a great deal of value on rational argumentation. 
When emotivism and experience reign seemingly without challenge, then an objective standard of rationality has very little teeth. Or perhaps it's better to say it does have teeth, but that's precisely the problem because biting people is not polite. The objectivity of truth once meant to protect now appears to be the very threat because it encroaches upon people and their perspectives. But perhaps there is another angle, another way to untangle this little knot. One that is rational, but precisely because it holds to the unique value of persons as the supreme reality of mystery, uh, supreme mystery of reality itself, and holds rationality to be a part of that mysterious reality of personhood. About this, Christian theology, I will argue, has a very unique avenue through which to speak. Christianity holds that at the foundation of reality lies not only an infinite divine nature, but also an infinite and ultimate personhood. Because we hold that God is not only nature, but also an eternal community of persons. As such, personhood is eternal. It's infinitely unique because everything about God is unique as only one is and can be God. And nothing else can be likened to the essential manner of God. I mean, nobody can be infinite or eternal. You have a beginning, so you can't become beginningless, thus become eternal. Now, this school of thought was made more popular in recent decades by John Paul II, who had a more phenomenological expression of it. But this was by no means the beginning of the school. The roots of it are actually scholastic and Franciscan. And some could actually argue it goes back further, but that lies beyond the scope of my talk. Theologians like Bonaventure and Scotus used a particular combination of definitions concerning persons. The first is from Boethius, the one that I was going to say we all know, but you're probably like, no, I don't. You're a dork. (laughs) The first is from Boethius, an individual substance of a rational nature. This was common amongst the scholastics, though generally considered incomplete. Thomas, for instance, added his own qualifier of individual substance, substantia completa per sin subsistin separata ab alia. Mmm, Latin. <laughs> or, a substance completed subsisting through itself distinguished from others. A substance of, person, of a person, the substance of a person, is whole and possesses distinctly all other, um, fr- distinct, it possesses its substance distinctly from all other substances including full possession of its own nature, its acts, and I would say, kind of adding some Augustine in there, desires. However, to this the Franciscans added a definition they received from the great mystical writer Richard of St. Victor, who defined persons as incommunicable, a uniqueness that could not be communicated to or replicated by another. Incommunicable. Now, what on earth does that even mean? I'm really glad you asked me that. (laughs) The Trinity, for Bonaventure, possessed the most salient expression of the principle of incommunicability, which is a personal principle. It is precisely the Father's personal incommunicability as the unbegotten one that distinguishes him from the Son, who is begotten, or the Spirit, who is spirated. The utter completeness of the Trinity lies in the inextricable community of love shared by three persons, but distinct as one who produces but is not produced, one who is produced and is producing, that's the Son, the second person, and one who is not, does not produce but is produced. This, again, sounds maybe a little funky, That's how we theologians and philosophers like to talk in ways that are impenetrable. But this is the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. In their unity, they are distinct because they are not each other. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. Am I right? You better believe it. But they have, and and that is because they have aspects they cannot communicate to each other. The Father has something he cannot communicate to the Son or the Spirit. That is unbegottenness. That belongs to the Father alone. And he cannot give his unbegottenness to anyone, not even other persons of the Trinity. 
The son cannot give his filiation or his sonship or his begottenness. They are distinct in those aspects. While sharing in the same nature, there's an incommunicable expression in their person that makes them distinct and yet unified. However, this incommunicability of the uniqueness of one's person does not preclude the possibility of communicability itself. Indeed, the ability to communicate the incommunicability of the person preserves his uniqueness, which in turns the possibility and provides the possibility to communicate from himself to something distinct from himself. Communication has to have at least two terms. To wit, for communication to be possible, there must be a distinction of personal terms, which are distinguished by their incommunicable aspects, the share of them, to share of themselves with another, and that is communication. Incommunicability in the Trinity is the principle of communication itself. Because the Father is not the Son, the Father can communicate with the Son, through the Son. If the Father and the Son were one, there would be no communication, there would just be God. For communication to work, it must in some way be intelligible. Intelligibility is the mark of communication, for it is logically impossible for a communication to be real and successful and yet also be unintelligible. That's an absurdity. In this way, the word is the intelligibility of the Father, communicating everything of the Father except for his unbegottenness, which the Father solely possesses. This word communicates back to the Father all that has been communicated, which terminates in the production of the person of the Spirit. This is the lover, the beloved, the love. The bond of communication is the Spirit. Thus God is communication, communion itself, who communicates inwardly through the hypostatic union of persons in the Trinity, and communicates outwardly in the sustained event of creation, including the creation of human persons. So, communication and incommunicability, these are twin principles of personhood, and you have to have both. Persons, Ratzinger shows us, exist because communication exists. Communication is between persons, always has been, always will be. But there must be something that remains them and not the other. Otherwise, it's not communication at all. It's just one single thing. The Trinity, hmm, good stuff. Now, if this is a bit dizzying, don't worry. Part of the glory of the mystery of the Trinity is that it is and always will be beyond our ability to comprehend. Okay, don't think you're going to come into a ballroom in Fort Wayne, Indiana, hear something on the Trinity and say, oh, okay, got it. And yet, it is this glorious mystery that we also share in because we too are persons, modeled after the very persons of the Trinity. This is what it means to be made in the imago Dei, the image of God, a communication from God. We know what it means to communicate while retaining our own unique individuality. We've been doing it since we were born a lot more loudly and obnoxiously, maybe earlier in our lives. Well, I don't know, for me. (laughs) Still obnoxious, still loud. This means that both the persons of the Trinity, God, and we persons are rational persons because meaninglessness can't be communicated. I can't communicate meaninglessness. Any more than I could, like, tell you silence. To wit, if someone's trying to say something and you don't understand them, do not get their meaning, it's not a form of communication. It's a failure of communication. Rationality is the faculty that enables the person to manage the intelligibility of things, to perceive the meaning of the communication, and then to make judgments about it. Rationality and intelligibility are themselves inextricably necessary for communication itself. There has to be meaning, and there has to be ability to extrapolate meaning. 
One of the most interesting things about views like perspectivism and motivism and relativism is that I do not see a sufficient explanation for communication itself. We do it so often, we think it's like easy. Until we live with someone and we realize communication is not easy. But we don't think about how incredible it is that I have this experience inside of me and you never have access to it in any immediate way. And yet we can sit and talk about things and agree that ice cream tastes good. Bananas? No. (laughs) Not good. Bad, bad, bad bananas. You can say, how can you say that? Bananas are so good. But you don't say, well, no, like, there's no possibility of you having a different experience about bananas than me. No, because you know what bad things it's like to taste something bad and good. This is not just a simple notion. Any philosopher will tell you communication is a mystery. How do we do it? It seems to me that if we can only possess our own experiences, which we can, then how could we ever have know that a communication with another person has ever even actually happened? If I'm not experiencing you understanding me, how do I know you do it? I do. I'm not arguing we don't. In fact, I think we absolutely do because I think communication is possible. My problem is I don't know how a relativist can explain that. So all this justice that you want to defend, how are you to explain it to me? How am I to understand it? And why should any of us care? I don't do this anymore, thank God. But I used to get into fights on Facebook with people in the comments. (laughs) And I don't mean anymore because I gave it up for Lent yesterday. I've, I've stepped away from it. But I distinctly remember in one of my one of these philosophical groups, someone started to defend relativism and the notion that there is no objective truth. Now, I will not bore you with their really bad argument. But the number of us are going back and forth, and suddenly it occurs to me, and I think, and I write, and snarky, wait, why is the relativist trying to use all kinds of reasons to convince us that he's right? Why is he doing that? That ended the conversation, by the way. One of my prouder moments. And why does he assume we'll understand what the hell he's even talking about? I don't understand. But there was one thing that really intrigued me about the conversation. Is that our relativist was indeed right about something. He said, you guys are trying to argue for objective truth, which is arguing for the existence of God. That's right. To argue for objective truth is to argue for the existence of God because at least we have the classical and correct mindset. I'm not. Well, yeah. We hold that God is being itself and whatever is, Augustine says, is true. Therefore, God is truth itself as well. Which brings me fully to tonight's topic. I'm almost done, sort of. When Jesus of Nazareth stood before Pilate, the Roman governor wanted to know if Jesus really thought he was a king. It would have been a pointed question indeed. Jesus, about to endure the extraordinarily, extraordinary brutality of the Romans, would have stood before Pilate already a beaten and bloodied man. I'll read, from you, I'll read to you now from John, the Gospel of John. This is uh, 19, 18. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. It's very much like Jesus. What have you done? I'm going to talk about something completely different than what you just asked me. (laughs) If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, 
so you're a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. (laughs) It's impossible. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? Jesus doesn't answer him. We are given no answer from Jesus. I don't know if Pilate just didn't give him a chance to respond. What is, oh, whatever, never mind. Or if Jesus simply didn't respond. But it doesn't matter in any case because Jesus had already given the answer five chapters earlier when he told his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus doesn't, doesn't say anything to Pilate, but we know what his answer would have been. The same answer he gave the crowd when they questioned him. Truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. What is truth? I am. Mm, Jesus. Christian theology agrees with other great philosophies, religious and otherwise, that truth is universal, that it is real, that it is intelligible. But what makes Christianity different is that its claim that truth is actually a person. The principle of truth, reality, universality, and intelligibility is the personal nature of communication, a a communication that belongs eternally with the Trinity and which God, through Jesus, communicates to us. Further, as an internal communication of persons, God, who is truth itself, is also the principle of personhood itself. We are persons because we are like God. Much of the struggle of the emotive emotive relativism I see in our uh, society is a desire to protect the dignity of persons from a cold, calculating rationality that is a a a tendency to depersonalize, dehumanize, and to destroy. But the Christian account is one that does not put persons at at odds with reason, as if they were at battle, but rather sees rationality flowing from the communicative ability possessed by distinct persons capable of true unity. Moreover, in this, we find that the vision of creation is a personal vision. For in the very act of creating, Scripture tells us, we find God pronouncing, it is good. The objectivity of the universe is personally approved of by God, who is its creator. The Christian claim to truth to channel Ratzinger is not only that truth exists, but truth knows me and loves me. That truth has said a word of love and worth to me. That truth stands ready to gather me into her bosom as a hen with her chicks. The Christian view of truth is not of a cold, logical reality, but of a real world fundamentally altered by love, a love that, as truth, founds the very ground of existence itself, proves it, gives it meaning, loves it, because God is, as the Christian scriptures say, love. Because God is the giver of existence, the God who is the giver of existence is himself an eternal communication of love between persons. The so-called postmodern critique is right, of course, that the experience, that experience is the ground of knowledge. We could never know anything without experiencing that knowledge. But not in the further claims, sometimes ex- implicit, sometimes quite explicit, that this somehow disrupts or subverts the, real- the objective quality of truth. Rather, love is at the heart of an experiential kind of knowledge, not irrational, but not reducible to purely rational modes any more than to uh, chemicals in the brain or evolutionary imperatives that accompanied the experience of love. If truth is a person who communicates in, constitutes, and is indeed, as the Christian scripture asserts, love, then truth cannot be a purely rational pursuit of intellectual quarry but demands the whole person, above all, the person's will, affections, and desires. This is why the aesthetic quality of truth cannot be denied. We talk about truth all the time because we want it. We desire truth and are drawn to its felicities, its beauties, because truth is infinitely beautiful and indeed the beautiful infinite. This is further why the Christian worldview proclaims that it is the special provenance of rational beings that is, humans and angels and God, not only to know, but also to love. 
This is Augustine's great argument in the De Trinitate. Truth is the design of love to express itself, to communicate, to make itself intelligible. And so the Christian view of God as Trinity is not an afterthought to the divine essence, as if it's the divine essence plus he's got three persons. So it's like a party. No. Rather, the Trinity is the foundation of reality just as much as the divine essence itself. The unity bespeaks Trinity and vice versa. They are not one or the other. Put as plainly as I can think of such a mysterious and comprehensible reality, God is an eternal community of internal communication and love and invites us through a special communication to share in that love. This is the very subject of theology. Literally in Greek, theology, logos and theos, a word about, from, to, for, God. All this to say, truth is love communicating itself. And if this truth is the principle of existence, then it possesses not only personal dignity, but an objective one. Because it is universally applicable to all other persons. This means that to be rational, to uphold the objective value and basic intelligibility of good, uh, truth and goodness, is to uphold the dignity of the person. The claim that truth is objective and morality exists is not oppressive. It serves. It is to call people to be real people. The Christian thus upholds the emotivist claim to personal dignity, but does not in turn rob this dignity of its objective value, its meaning, its purpose. It is the harmony of our subjective experiences unified by the fact that they are all loved by truth. And this is, and it is this communicative, communicative ability that bespeaks its basic rationality. Truth is a person fully re- revealed in Christ in whom there is no contradiction. The fundamental logic of reality, says Christian theology, is that everything is in some way, to some degree, a reflection of and a communication from the Holy Trinity, revealed most fully in the very man who stood before Pilate 2,000 years ago, heard his question, what is truth, and said nothing. This man from Nazareth, soon crucified, to be crucified, had already said that he is the truth. What more indeed was there to say? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Giltner. Um, we have some time for some questions, if you like. I'll come around with the mic. How do I cite this speech for a paper? <laughs> um, well, I think I, you can just ask me and I'll give it to you, and then you can okay. look at the Chicago manual style and figure out what to do next. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is very nice. I, I assume it's a compliment. I don't know. It could be. So Dr. Giltner says, <laughs> but yeah, just email me and I'll give it to you. This is either a great sign or a really bad one. said that Trinity will be something we will not fully understand uh, when we die, go to heaven, will we fully understand it then? No. Um, but this isn't a bad thing. Um, so, first of all, we, we shouldn't be surprised that God would be utterly beyond our capacity to understand. And um, because we're created and God is uncreated. Um, God is a single essence with three persons in three persons, not with, in three persons, and we only possess our single personhood. So there's things about God that just go beyond our ability to understand. But um, it doesn't mean that uh, we will not be filled to our own capacity of understanding. So what the tradition says is that we will understand everything that we are capable of and be fully satisfied by this. And then 
um, in the tradition of the East or in like, say, Maximilian Kolbe, who was a very good Franciscan thinker, talks about this epictosis, which is that we keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into the mystery, but we never actually um, uh, exhaust it. So we keep learning more and more and growing deeper and deeper. There's this great moment at the end of uh, The Last Battle, C.S. Lewis's, uh, one of his last Chronicles of Narnia book, where they're going into heaven and they keep yelling further up and further in, further up and further in. I think it'll be something like that. Every moment we understand more, and yet every moment, because God is infinite, there is more to grasp. So we'll never fully comprehend the Trinity, but we're going to spend eternity reveling in that fact. I think the gentleman behind you... Not allowing for the Trinity, not allowing for God or Jesus, would you say that there is no truth? Absolutely not. I would say that well, oh no, I, you said not allowing for God. Yeah. If God does not exist, truth is a, a, is, is a completely a social construct. It's made up. I would say that in order for there to be a true meaning to the universe, there has to be one who gave it meaning. If God does not exist, I agree with Camus and Nietzsche and the great existentialists and absurdists. If God does not exist, the world is absurd. There's no meaning to it. There's no truth. And then we are just lost in this kind of play of dominations like Foucault talks about. So I would say not allowing God, you don't get truth. With God, there is rationality and truth. Without it, there's nothing. So I understand like the absurdists and Nietzsche and the great atheists who say, God doesn't exist, and so, wow, this sucks. Let's just make the best of it until we die, and then we just recede into the void. And I understand people who are like, no, there's like rational reasons to believe in God. First cause argument, um, the argument from ontology, these various uh, things that we can deduce and that humans have been deducing from the natural created order since you know, we began writing philosophy. What I don't ever understand is people who want to have rationality but know God. Uh, Lewis destroys this in his book and Miracles and Supernature and Nature. How, how can we have a principle of rationality if nature is the only principle and nature is not rational? Where does it arise from? Where does it come from? So no, I'd say not allowing for God, you don't get truth. You get them together or you don't get them at all. Uh, David Bentley Hart makes this case really well in um, The Experience of God. Uh, I think the subtitle is like uh, Being, Consciousness, and Bliss. He also makes this argument really well. So yeah, without God, the universe is absurd. Um, My question for you is, uh, what is it? Where are you? (laughs) Oh, hi. Hi. Um, my question for you is, what is the ground of knowledge? What is what? What is the ground of knowledge? You like mentioned it in your speech. Ground. ground of knowledge, yeah. So that's something of a metaphor. So we talk about in philosophy the ground of knowledge or the ground of being. So the ground is like, you can't really ask the question, well, what's under the ground? You know, you can like in like colloquial moments, you can say like the sewer or something like that. But, like, what's under the bottom? Well, it's the bottom. There's nothing under the bottom. It is the bottom. Uh, Wittgenstein talks about how this is the moment where the spade turns back up against you. Uh, There's no lower to go. So when we talk about the ground of being, we talk about the fundamental instance of being itself, which is to say there's there's nothing underneath it. So someone asked the question, well, if God made everything, who made God? Well, this question is about as meaningful as me asking you, uh, how many hours are in the color red? Um, How many miles of the gallon does your phone get? A lot? A little? Okay, it's not a a sensible question. Who made God? You can't ask who who is the maker of being itself who is also being itself. What's the source of the source? I don't know, what's the tomato of a tomato? Um, being itself is the source, and so it is the ground. There's nothing under it. It's the bottom. We've reached the bottom. It's infinite being. Everything else goes up, out, doesn't go back, doesn't go under. 
This is the, this is it. No more questions. You ever, you're like, okay, so you, you ever talk to a t- toddler? <laughs> what do toddlers ask? Why? 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 Why can't I go outside? Because it's raining. Why? Because gra- uh, water, it's uh, falling out of the sky. Why? Because it come out of a cloud. Why? Because clouds form when there's vapor. I don't know. Why? I don't know. These are the ends of the things that I know. I know no more things. Why? Because I didn't pay attention in environmental science. Why? I don't know. And this goes on and on, right? And eventually you just have to say, because that's the end. No more. It is this way. That's first principles. That's the ground of being. (laughs) Okay. Question. Um, so you said that everyone has principles that lead them to conclusions, but principles are different for each uh, people, right? They can be, yeah. Okay. And then, so if someone else's view is different with this thinking, uh, then they're equally convinced, so it's true to both of them. I am arguing with that view. Okay. Um, so, then, oh, go ahead. No, I was just making sure we're on the same page. Yeah. Side, so um, so uh, you say that these things are true, but... Well, how would you respond to somebody saying, okay, that's your truth that these things are true. My truth is that they're not true. Well, so I guess, and see, that's kind of what I'm actually searching for in this, this page. So this is an experiment. I don't know if this argument, I think it works. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. Um, but kind of what I'm getting at is, yeah, what do you say to that? Because you can tell them, oh, that's self-refuting, but then they can come back with the same nonsense, which is, Oh, that's your truth. It's not my truth, right? They can look you dead in the face. That they're not up for a rational discussion. Um, sometimes now there ha- I've had students come to me and say I was a relativist. I'm not anymore because you showed that it's. But I, those people aren't the convinced kind of relativists. They're they're waiting for someone to have a better explanation. But somebody who's really a convinced relativist and will really stand behind this notion, you can either say like. You know, you can give them the aspect of like, well, you don't live that way. If I punch you, you're going to react. And you're not going to say, well, what was your truth about it? Okay? If you run in, you can, you can believe it's true that if you don't have to, uh, you can shapeshift or you can move through walls. But if you run into the wall, that wall is going to disagree with you. <laughs> and so you can try that, or you can try to talk about... Um, what makes their view better than anyone else's um, in terms of, of what makes right and wrong? What makes justice? So where people get kind of um, caught in this is when they're, when they're you, you find some cause that they care about, basically, has been my experience. So I had a friend who was some sort of relativist, but, but the environment and climate change and blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, wait a second. Why is this better than anybody else's view? Why, why should you be out there pushing this view? It's kind of like the Facebook conversation I had where, it's like, why are you arguing about this? You know? So you're going to find something that shows they're not really a relativist because they care about something and they want other people to believe it's important too. Well, to that I would say, you know, um, I think you can set a standard of beliefs based on what advances society and your species the most, because you can go back biologically, we are wired to help ourselves and help our, sorry, thank you. We're wired to help ourselves and help our species. Are we wired that way? How are we wired that way? I forget, um, it was Richard Dawkins. Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, all right. And in his book, uh, This Selfish Gene, Mm -hmm. yeah, Uh, he explains it much better than I could, but basically, um, because we are uh, all humans, the same species, just like apes do this, ants do this, crocodiles do this, they'll even uh, go to the extent to eat their own you know, to protect their species as a whole. Right. So they don't get too overpopulated. Right. So then I think the, I think the, the, the rub of that is, all right, so what if someone wants to eat their own young? What do you tell them? I tell them it doesn't advance our society as a But whole. there's got to be an evolutionary reason why animals chose to do that at some point. It has to advance the species because the whole logic of evolution is Things the 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 species do that because in some way it's going to help them carry on. 
So if you're telling someone, well, that won't advance the species, but that... Well, go ahead, respond yeah, to that. Some species it does. Like, uh, for example, I like said alligators. Right. If there are too many alligators, eventually those young will grow old and their food sources... There's too many down. people right now, they tell us. Should we eat our young? They tell us there are too many people. Yeah, there's like six That's billion people true. and counting, and like we're running out. That's very true. Seven. So should we... I mean, there have been... There have been nations who have said, like, you can't have uh, so many children, and so people want to make sure they have sons, so they kill their daughters. Is that okay? The, I mean, I feel, like, I feel like the problem here is that if the, moral, if the moral code is advancement of society, first of all, that's not science. That's, that's an ought. So we're out of the realm of science now. Science can tell you what things do. It can tell you about facts. It can say one, uh, it can use math or physics or whatever, but it can't tell you what value is. So advancement is a value term. What counts as advancement of a society? What's, I mean, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps we should have let the Nazis do their thing. And I'm not, this is not gamed at you personally, right? Absolutely. But perhaps we let the Nazis do their, their thing because overpopulation is a problem, right? it would maybe advance the society to get rid of this entire race of beings. Well, I'm going to argue that no, that's not an advancement, but not because um, it may or may not help what evolution calls the survival or success of a species. I'm going to argue it's wrong because evolution can't tell me what's valuable, whereas goodness can. And it is good if there's human flourishing, and it is bad if you single people out on the basis of, say, their biology that they're Jewish, and kill them for it. I don't see in Dawkins' selfish gene model any sort of real possibility for moral discourse beyond the advancement of society, which isn't a scientific statement. That's a, that's a moral philosophy, advancement of society. And so what I find with people like Richard Dawkins and other these new atheist types is that they don't have a concept for morality, and yet they talk about it all the time, and they're not trained to talk about it. They're trained to talk about science. And science can only tell you what something is. It can't tell you what you ought to do with it. Science can tell you how to split an atom. It can't tell you whether you should drop an atom bomb. That is the realm of moral philosophy. So, anyway, I think that would be my response to that, is that doing things for the advancement of a society is not actually a scientific statement. It looks like one sometimes, but it's not. It's actually a philosophical one. Thank you. Thank you. That was an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, you said that relativism is not irrational refutable. Irrational refutable. No, but it's not. It, it's not. It's not irrefutable either. It's of a different kind of thing because it's not a rational position. So if you don't hold that rationality counts for anything then I can't use rationality to refute you or unrefute. I can say rationality, or excuse me, relativism is irrational from my point of view because I hold that rationality is universal. But a relativist cannot say that their position is rational or irrational because the very concept of rationality includes objective truth value. If there's no objective truth value, there is no concept of rationality beyond like some kind of social construct we all agree that this is approvable and this is not. Um, and, and so then it becomes like G.E. Moore argues that like saying something good is akin to pointing at something and saying that's yellow. Really? Wow. So I should have played with crayons a lot more apparently when I was a kid. Get my moral training from that. Was that, do you have more? No, that was all. Oh, okay. Sorry if I talked over you. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Okay, what you're pointing out uh, to me, as I understand it, is that uh, uh, the position that you're critiquing is incoherent. Yeah. And, and yet you at one time, I think I heard you yeah. say that you took, you were incoherent. Yeah. Why? I think for a lot of the reasons I'm trying to explore in this paper... Um, so I was a perspectival relativist, what's sometimes called um, internal subjective relativism. Again, there are different types out there. 
and they argue for different from different ways. My big issue was that internal societies seem to have internal logics and they seem to have different experiences and thus different experiences of how they understand the world, how they talk about it, and thus different understandings of words like justice, fairness, goodness, badness, humanness, whatever. And so my inclination was to say that if that structure is internally coherent within that system, how can I say it's invalid? How can I, from an outside perspective, say their system is invalid? Um, to pre, like, preemptively answer, I think, the next question, which is what made me think that that was incoherent, was because of the fact that I still find myself in a position of non-contradiction. Because then I have to say, well, I ought not go in and do this. It is bad to go in and tell them they're wrong. Therefore, it's good not to tell them they're wrong. Now I've created a dichotomy. And I said, you can either be, do the right thing or not. Well, that's the law of non-contradiction. And there I am back again. And then when you actually look at these societies, they don't have different logics. They have different ways of working out their first principles, but they all use the, the, the law of non-contradiction. You know, they, they, they use the law of the excluded middle, that something can't be, you know, both false and true at the same time. They'll use the law of identity, that something is what it is. So when, you, when we talk about in philosophy, and I know you're a theologian and philosopher too, so I'm not, but just for, for all of us here, when we talk about in philosophy there being different logics, what we mean is not that when it comes to the realm of logic that there are different kinds of logic and some might be based on the non-contradiction law and some might be. What we mean is that logic does different things in different applied systems. So there's a logic to dancing. There's a logic to football. There's a logic to writing a mystery novel. But it's not as if they're actually different logics. People hear there's logics to these things. So there's a crystal logic to creation, right, in the incarnation. But it assumes these first principles, that God was incarnated in the first place, and then using logic works out to certain conclusions. So in that way, people can use logic to come to different conclusions from different first principles, but they're not using a different kind of logic as if it's a logic without the law of non-contradiction. Um, yeah, that's kind of what brought me back from that, is that I wasn't being consistent. I wasn't actually being consistent. And uh, probably all the, whole, the Holy Spirit, probably, too, <laughs> helped with that, I'd say. Great. Okay. Well, we want to thank everyone for coming this evening. We have one more. One more. Just in terms of, like, in the beginning, we talked about logic or rational. So from this standpoint, like, I don't think students are arguing with the math professor. No. Saying that's not true. No. So how how do you but but how do you leverage that or if you have that approach in the math class, how do you take that in to the theology class or the philosophy class? I think in a lot of the ways we've been doing right now, like just naming absurdities, way having Socrates Socrates was amazing at this. Oh, you have a proposition. That's funny. Let's 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 play with that proposition. Let's see where it goes. And then it would ultimately lead to absurd places. Okay, the universe is only material. That's what you're told. It's just, it's just matter. All right, well, give me 17. Remember this? Give me 17. What? 17 what? I didn't ask for 17 coconuts. I didn't ask for 17 pieces of paper. I'll take $17. But I want you to give me the number 17. And of course, the answer is I can't. Why not? Because it's not a material thing. 17 is in the mind. It has manifestations in reality, but I can't take 17 for a walk, get its hair cut, talk to him about my problems. Like, I can't do these things because it's not a material thing. It's a concept within the mind. So if you're going to say that the whole world is simply material, you're going to have to get me to believe that one of the main ways we engage with the material world, i.e. through numbers and mathematics, is not real. Well, that's absurd. So maybe there's more than material. That kind of thing. All right. Um, I can get you right afterwards if, you, if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs>